Hi everyone. So uh, in this session, we are going to um, investigate the topic of research about the collaborative uh, economy. Um, with me for this topic, I have Francesca Bria from Nesta, Jacques-François Marchandise from The Thing, Fabrizio Sestini from the European Commission, and uh, Michael Bowens, founder of the Peer-to-Peer -Peer Foundation. So before digging into this topic and um, trying to understand the scope of the collaborative economy and how this relates to research, I'm going to first ask to each of our panelists to introduce themselves and their work in, uh, in two or three minutes. So we should start with the ladies. So Francesca, you can you please start? Can, so can somebody plug the, um, the, f the mics that we can? Okay, thanks. So hi everyone, I'm Francesca. I'm Italian, but I'm based in the UK, in London. And I'm actually a researcher at Imperial College in the Digital Economy Lab, where I work on different topics around the digital economy, ranging from the Internet of Things, smart cities, um, social networking, and so on. And I'm an ESTA associate on digital social innovation and collective platforms. So we are running a big European-based study on this topic. Um, which mainly is actually around the internet economy and how it's evolving and its future. So I think it's exciting to be discussing this now. Hi, I'm uh, Jacques-François Marchandise of Thing, Fondation Internet Nouvelle Génération in Paris. Uh, I, I might say the, the same keywords as uh, Francesca, which means uh, uh, digital uh, innovation, transformation, and so on, network. Uh, so we, we, have, we are an NGO with uh, about uh, 300 uh, members, and we work about, uh, about the digital transformations of uh, society and economy. Uh, mo mostly uh, on uh, innovative uh, processes, as well as we, we try to work with researchers uh, and to, to make bridges between uh, research and the rest of the world on various topics. Hi, <coughs> I am Fabrizio Sestini from the European Commission. Uh, I'm working in uh, DG Connect. <coughs> Uh, which is the DG uh, dealing with, uh, uh, on one side, uh, all the regulatory and policy aspects of telecommunications in Europe. On the other side, uh, with the funding of uh, research initiatives in the domain of ICT. Uh, just to give an idea that the budget, the typical budget we manage is uh, 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 nearly 1 billion euro per year. Uh, and in the framework of this budget, which is mostly devoted to support uh, uh, industrial research on uh, uh, ICT technologies, uh, we have uh, recently launched an initiative uh, uh, stimulating more the collaborative side rather than the competitive side of uh, ICT, which is called Collective Awareness Platforms. Um, Probably most of you or some of you are aware of this, uh, and we will talk more about uh, uh, the projects. Uh, actually, we have uh, uh, just uh, uh, selected a few projects in the first call of this uh, initiative, uh, and uh, we look forward to launch uh, another call uh, by the end of this year. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Michel Bowens. Uh, I'm Belgian, but I live in Thailand. and. In 2005, I've created with some other people the uh, Foundation for Peer-to-Peer -peer Alternatives. Uh, our tagline is, we peer produce knowledge about peer production. It's kind of like a, a loop. Uh, and basically, we are a global collaborati of, uh, collaboratory of researchers that um, collaborate to the creation of a wiki, which now has about 20,000 articles uh, on these topics. Um, we reach about 20 million visitors until now and maybe 30,000 per day. Uh, and basically that's our goal is to increase the knowledge about what we believe is an emerging uh, new economic and social model. Um, right now our interest is in the shift of peer production from the more immaterial um, projects like Wikipedia and Linux, so code and, and, and knowledge towards uh, how it impacts physical production. So we're particularly interested in distributed manufacturing uh, with 3D, machine, 3D printing machines, but also distributed capital like crowdfunding, social lending, peer-to-peer -peer currencies. And so basically we are looking at how this is changing 
uh, the structures of our society, but also the economic model. Thank you, all of you. <coughs> so um, I would like to start with a, um, a question for you, uh, Michel. Um, so when we talk about peer-to-peer uh, -peer and the collaborative economy, obviously we speak uh, about a lot of different uh, things, from collaborative consumptions to peer production to uh, um, uh, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, and so on. Um, these topics are all use the internet and combine online and offline, but um, they are different in nature, in their models, in the type of actors, and surely the, the, the um, research work on these topics is quite different, involves different scientific disciplines and so on. So could you make maybe make a, um, a quick overview for everyone about the, the scope of the collaborative economy according to you and what are the big areas we could isolate for, for research? Okay, well, um, just to give you an idea of the possible uh, scope and scale of collaborative economy, there is a report in the you know, United States uh, called the Fair Use Economy, which calculates the economic activities around open content, open code, and open design, and everything that's needed around it. And they already arrive at 70 million workers and one-sixth of GDP. So we're not exactly talking about marginal um, something. We're talking about um, modes of uh, production that are actually already uh, the, a big part of our society. Um, so I think the key thing to understand is the ability that people now have to create value together outside of institutions. This is the key innovation. Then you can have a bottom-up approach, like the free software world, which started with communities, then build foundations, and then attract companies around it. So you have three players, uh, the community of contributors, the foundations that manage and enable the projects, like the Wikimedia Foundation, and then you have entrepreneurial coalitions that hire people who contribute uh, to these uh, commons of code uh, in order to create market, uh, market value on top of it. But there's also a top-down adaptation, so more and more big companies uh, think about Procter & Gamble with 50% of its new products uh, through open innovation. So we have all the modalities like open innovation, crowdsourcing, co-creation, co-design, which is about companies trying to use these collaborative dynamics, but under their control and within their value chain. So that's an important distinction to make, whether if it is a dynamic bottom-up or top-down. Uh, I would say an, another important distinction is what is being mutualized. So we have in open source and free software, we have a mutualization of immaterial resources. But in, crowd, in uh, collaborative consumption, we have a mutualization of physical infrastructure. So that's another important distinction. I think a crucial distinction also is the one between market dynamics and non-market dynamics. Uh, for example, couchsurfing, uh, I would say, is uh, essentially a non-market dynamic. If you don't have money, it's interesting. You can lodge uh, everywhere. Uh, but if you're poor and you have an extra room, that's not going to really uh, help you. Otherwise, uh, then Airbnb, which is a purely market dynamic, uh, will allow you to monetize uh, those idle resources. So in each field, we will have actually competitions between or maybe not competitions, complementarities between market and non-market approaches, which also are very important inside the projects. So like uh, inside the commons of Linux, you have a non-market dynamic, but then there around it, there is a market dynamic. So all these things are quite important. Um, I would say um, that you have to look especially at governance and ownership, very important. Um, that determines pretty much uh, the logic uh, of what's going to happen in these projects. Uh, I'll say a bit more about that later. Um, so I think given the variety uh, of modalities that the collaborative economy uh, takes, uh, we need an object-oriented approach. We need a transdisciplinary approach. I don't think even disciplines can do justice uh, to this. So we have to start from a particular object of knowledge. And from there, I think, assemble uh, the, kind of the kind of research methodologies, disciplines that we may need in order to understand 
that particular object. Another object is going to take another combination of research. Um, now, one more thing before I stop. Uh, you have to stop me because uh, uh, I can go on. Uh, ah, okay. Um, is uh, you know if you if you work like me in the informal knowledge uh, space, uh, scientific research is problematic. First of all, we don't have access to it because it's closed access, for, uh, or and it's expensive to get. So um, you know my kind of communities we. Uh, we work with open knowledge that's not necessarily coming out of formal research. And the second thing is formal research is way too slow uh, to actually uh, be useful to the people in the field. So free software, which exists for about 20 years now, is very well covered. Um, you know, there is plenty of interesting research about every aspect of free software. But you look at open hardware, um, well, you have basically you have to rely on uh, master theses uh, and young researchers, um, you know, and their drafts. Because uh, if you have to wait for the the labs, then uh, by you know by the time um, we'll be with four degrees um, climate change anyway. So let's let's hurry up, guys. <laughs> so you make an um, interesting. Thank you, Michel. Uh, you make an interesting uh, point, uh, Maxime. Can you raise the a little bit the the volume, if possible. Yeah. Um, you make an interesting point, um, which is like um, basically we need to uh, to rethink the the way we do research to study the collaborative uh, economy, to have an object-oriented approach and maybe a leaner, quicker approach. Um, I would like to get the views of uh, each of you. Uh, I don't know who wants to start about uh, like how to deal with the collaborative economy in terms of research, uh, in terms of um, topics, disciplines, or object-oriented uh, approach. Maybe Fabrizio, you wish to start? I feel very much concerned, indeed, about the topic. So uh, it is true that applying to the European uh, uh, programs for uh, funding of research activities is quite cumbersome. Uh, there are procedures and rules to, to, to uh, to be known uh, and uh, uh, processes uh, which must be followed and which have, uh, uh, which entail uh, um, a relatively long time for research, especially for developing this kind of research initiatives or, or to develop this kind of research ideas uh, uh, which are very time sensitive. Uh, typically, uh, the timing for uh, uh, setting up a call uh, managed by the European Commission and then to get funded is uh, at least uh, one year because then we need some time uh, to, to, to define the call, to agree it and to discuss it at European level. Then we publish a call, we keep it open for some three months, then uh, we evaluate proposals which takes a few months, we negotiate proposals, and then we launch, uh, we sign the contract and we launch the proposal. So the typical duration of this cycle is one year. And uh, each participant to the proposal then uh, has uh, to submit uh, a lot of uh, uh, administrative documents to prove uh, some financial viability. It is true that uh, applying to these programs is quite cumbersome. Now, uh, as you know, uh, we are defining, um, we are almost publishing, uh, actually, uh, the uh, work program for the next uh, 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 framework uh, research program, which is called Horizon 2020. Uh, of course, the late motive, as usual, is uh, to simplify the rules and in some cases, in some aspects, actually, rules are a bit simpler than, than in the past. However, uh, you should, uh, uh, well, y you know that uh, this is uh, public money, which is allocated by a public body. So at national level, already, the rules are quite complicated, and we are trying to cope with the requirements and the constraints of 27 uh, member states. Mm -hmm. So do not expect uh, miracles in that mm -hmm. respect. But uh, we are trying also to find some, uh, some tricks uh, or some... Uh, um, uh, innovative manners to deal with this. Uh, so one is, uh, for instance, in this call uh, uh, on collective awareness platforms, which uh, uh, we will launch, uh, we will uh, we are negotiating the projects and we will launch them in a few months. Uh, one of these projects is uh, um, actually um, uh, a cascade, we call it a cascade project, in the sense that they will use, uh, they will uh, uh, manage a budget of 3 million euro not to do research on their own, but actually to launch open calls uh, in turn, so not uh, open calls managed by the European Commission directly, but managed by them, 
then uh, with much simpler rules and possibly some uh, a quicker uh, uh, selection uh, uh, time to, to select initiatives even uh, at a smaller scale than what we usually mm -hmm. fund uh, to fund uh, um, uh, uh, research ideas uh, in this domain of collaborative economy, in the domain of uh, uh, which we call uh, uh, collective awareness, so to stimulate uh, collective in solutions based uh, on collective intelligence to cope with sustainability issues. And uh, uh, so this project will be started in, uh, uh, in a few months, and then uh, we'll start uh, to launch these open calls, which we hope will be a way to provide some seed funding for innovative ideas in this domain. Mm. Uh, this is a, a kind of experiment we are running uh, in this call. Uh, if it, this is successful, then uh, we might think of uh, launching more of these initiatives in the future. Uh, so this is a way to cope with this. But so it's true that uh, access to European funding is quite uh, heavy uh, from an administrative point of view and also from the point of view of timing. Mm. So m maybe before I ask uh, uh, Francesca to come on because she's actually managing a European project, just could you give like very shortly like two or three examples of uh, projects, uh, research projects that have been uh, founded that are being managed at the EU level that would be of uh, relevance to... Uh yeah, well, well uh, the details uh, will be uh, made public only in a few uh, weeks now because uh, they are under negotiation. Uh, one that uh, maybe I can um, just very briefly talk about uh, because also resonates with uh, uh, a presentation I just heard uh, this morning in a previous session which was about uh, waste leaks. Uh, so this project instead uh, is called the WikiRate uh, and it aims uh, at uh, um, uh, allowing citizens to rate uh, the corporate social responsibility of companies, so to uh, post claims, uh, possibly uh, substantiated claims, uh, about uh, the way companies manage corporate social responsibility and then uh, um, provide ways to rank companies based uh, on the CSR uh, assessed on the basis of uh, citizens' claims. So this is just to give an idea of the kind of projects we are funding. Then uh, there are others. Uh, the name is WikiRate. But again, uh, uh, this is uh, a very uh, preliminary and informal announcement because uh, the formal announcement will be made in a few weeks uh, when uh, we are ready to uh, sign the contract. Uh, formally, uh, we are bound not to disclose. Uh, uh, I cannot tell you who, is, who are the participants or what is the budget at this stage, but just in a few weeks uh, we will be able. I will ask Francesca maybe to comment on uh, the project you are working on at this moment and maybe you could tell about uh, th the topics, the kind of uh, scientific disciplines you involve and what are the approach you have for this kind of project? Sure. I mean, I think, uh, first of all, I think actually the challenge is played out here very clearly because I think, for example, the program that Fabrizio is talking about that the Commission is running right now, which is this collective awareness platform, shows the need of institutions which, which are top-down institutions, hierarchical institutions that fund, you know, R&D programs. They usually are kind of structured on the vertical closed innovation model. And these kind of networks of innovators and people that do things and they do it differently is challenging those institutions to change and to kind of redesign the way that actually fundings are allocated, but also the way that themselves support these kind of networks without undermining, you know, the, auto the autonomy of the network and lots of different things that this network needs. So I think that already you see how actually because of the collaborative kind of innovation happening out there, institutions are changing. And I think this is the first thing for us really importantly. I think today, yes, it's through Procter & Gamble, like the private sector understood that innovation is not happening anymore only in R&D departments of company. So innovation is out there, is everywhere, is distributed. The innovators have their tools and their capacity to organize themselves and come up with new things. And, and, and how do you enable this innovation to actually grow and sustain? So I think for me, this tension between the top down and the bottom up is really the key issue here. And I think we don't see it only in the kind of policy or the kind of funding or even the kind of enabling uh, matters. I think we see it really as, as, a, as an issue here for a community like this. I mean, if we think about open source or the hackers community, for instance, on the internet, I think they've been innovating in the way they, they do things since long time. And I think now with the emergence of 
do-it-yourself spaces everywhere and collaboration on a larger scale, on a massive scale, enabled of course by the web and the internet, I think it's reaching a maturity right now for which you know, we now have to think about sustainability. So how do you go from here? And, and, and without encountering this kind of, or, or even challenging in a disruptive way, hierarchical institutions, I think basically uh, it's, it's hard to go about. And, and just to connect to what Michael said, the internet I think today has moved beyond just challenging the industry. So we saw how the internet transformed you know, the film industry, the music industry, lots of different industries. I think today it's challenging institutions of the real world, you know, like government, like democracy, like banking, like finance, you know, like schools, like public services. I think we're now into, you know, the real world in, in a kind of massive, and we don't know how that's working. So uh, to go, I, I mean, we don't know what's gonna happen and we don't, don't wanna be technological deterministic at all. I think technology, it's one component. And I think of course it's important because if you have a decentralized infrastructure and people own it, you can develop in a way that sustain yourself and maybe really disrupt in the business model. If you're relying on, you know, let's say a big integrated ecosystem and the company own all the assets, I'm sure you will grow in a different way. So uh, going back to our research project, I think what we're doing, and we're running a study for the European Commission, which is uh, run by Nesta, which is the UK Innovation Agency. And basically we are running a study which is about digital social innovation. And of course we wanna go beyond the buzzword, and it's really, we are doing a kind of collaborative, let's say, open crowdsourcing mapping exercise in which we really wanna get communities themselves to participate and collaborate in the way data is produced. Because a lot of the problems we think it's, okay, what are we talking about? How do we measure? What works? What doesn't work? And what are the impact indicators? Which a lot, in a lot of cases, I think here in this community, the impact indicators is not GDP. It's not return on investments only. It's new ways to measure the value which is created and the way that communities understand that, that value. So for us, it's really important to get kind of thickness in there. But the way we're doing it is, co is involving other actors. For example, the VAG Society is part of the study, which is an institution in Holland, which has been pioneering digital innovation since many, many years. Um, and then we have um, IRI, which is an institute that does research on collective intelligence and the internet here in Paris. And then we have ESADE, which is a business school, which is very engaged with open innovation models and understanding the business side of it. And our intention, and here I call out to all of you, it's actually to reach out and engage people in this mapping exercise, which means not only uh, you know, be able to map the actors which are not usually there. So I think when Fabrizio says it's almost impossible to come to an R&D proposal in the EC, which is mainly run by big companies with huge consortium with a lot of resources, and how the innovators, like the micro, micro entrepreneurs, the communities, the, the kind of small organization, how do they access there? So we wanna start by first of all mapping these non-institutional actors, which are the key and the factors that enable innovation. That's, that's what we're trying to do. Thank um, you, Francesca. Um, I'll ask uh, Jacques-Francois maybe to talk about um, the, all the work you've been doing uh, at uh, the thing for quite some time about uh, all these topics, what you've observed, and maybe talk about the next uh, initiative you're going to, to launch. And if you want to reflect on the way research, why we need research on, on that topic. Uh, we, we need it because we are on uh, uh, very unknown uh, transformations uh, and we, we need research that is uh, at the same time quick and reactive and uh, that is able to show us not only the photograph but, but the film. The film will be more interesting than uh, the, the photograph of, of how things are today. Uh, so we, we need research that uh, works at the same time uh, today and uh, on long-term issues. Uh, that's the, the first thing and the first difficult thing. Uh, the second thing that we are very used, especially in, uh, in uh, digital uh, uh, economy and digital uh, uses, uh, we are very used to, to having uh, uh, strategies decided without any uh, conscience of what research produces, actually. We have a, a load of uh, nice researchers 
young uh, uh, PhDs and young, young uh, researchers working on very accurate topics and a lot of decisions, a lot of even investments that are taken without knowing uh, uh, anything about the, that research. So th there is a, a huge work in, in various uh, fields uh, as well in economy, as in uh, education, as in democracy, and so on. Uh, we th there is so this, this is a point where we we have initiatives at Fing, uh, especially what we call connector recherche, uh, research connections. Uh, we we have uh, very soon uh, uh, two days of meetings in, uh, in, in during Futur en Seine in Paris, thirteenth uh, and, and 14th of June, uh, about that that kinds of methods of, con of uh, uh, dialogue. So m maybe you could remind like in 30 seconds wha what is the, the thing for people who don't know uh, because no, no, but not everyone in the room may be familiar with it and what exactly the kind of research work you're, you're doing? So uh, we, we are a, s a team of about 15 people. We publish a media that is uh, Internet Actu. Some of some of you may, may, may know it. And we uh, uh, in I among our members we have uh, uh, as well researchers, as uh, NGOs, as uh, 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 schools, as uh, uh, companies, as small and big companies, as uh, uh, public authorities, and we, we try uh, to, to work on, on various topics. For instance, at the moment we are working for years about transformation, uh, urban transformations, what the digital uh, era changes for uh, in the towns, and we uh, we specially uh, try to understand uh, how the in inhabitants uh, may be uh, stakeholders in uh, in towns transformations in various ways. Uh, as well, we've been working a lot on open data. We've been working a lot on uh, uh, open gov. Uh, we've been working a lot on fab labs, and we are we will be starting very soon. Uh, with we share and with some people in this room uh, a, a work a one year work about uh, uh, what happens after ownership what happens in uh, in the collaborative economy uh, if uh, it happens that we uh, that if uh, that ownership uh, starts being uh, something of the past so w maybe you can quote like one or two questions that are going to be raised during this uh, research because the angles were, were quite interesting. Yes, uh, one of them is uh, uh, a point that Michel uh, pointed out uh, in, in his intervention, which is uh, how uh, the business actors and collaborative dynamics uh, match together or not. Uh, together or not, that means uh, at what stage uh, is there something that might go wrong uh, between uh, the access to platforms uh, and and the kind of recentralizations and kinds of the end of the game uh, ser serious people uh, uh, take the control back and so on we we've seen that already on various points uh, of the of the uh, internet for instance some people point out the f the, the idea of uh, uh, Minitel 2.0 uh, for the the, uh, the evolution of internet to to the cloud computing, so that there is something that uh, that can occur. Another thing that is quite uh, a little known today is uh, how far can uh, the uh, do-it-yourself issues and the uh, open source uh, software issue uh, go in uh, in a non-digital world. Uh, how far ca can uh, the, the uh, open source uh, logics uh, exceed uh, the, the, uh, the digital uh, world? Uh, and another one uh, is, uh, is about empowerment. Uh, do we have a, a collaborative economy that is producing empowerment or not? Uh, uh, when we go to from, uh, uh, from ownership to access, is that uh, more ownership, more possession or more uh, 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 power uh, distributed or less power distributed mm. uh, to people or is it distributed to always the same people? Mm. So um, since we have uh, 20 minutes left, I would uh, like to keep 10 minutes for, question for asking you two questions and maybe 10 minutes for the audience just to have an idea. How who in the audience is a researcher or doing some kind of research work? Could you raise your hand? 
Okay, so a lot of people interesting by this topic, obviously. Um, so uh, the, the two small questions I would like to ask each of you is what is, in your opinion, the most important or relevant piece of research work that has been done up to now on the collaborative economy uh, because it, raise, it uh, brings a lot of data or, it, uh, or interesting facts? And uh, Michel, you're not allowed to quote the, the, the yourself <laughs> <laughs> because obviously for uh, people who don't know, M Michel made a, a very uh, large study about the synthetic, synthetic of 400 pages overview of the collaborative economy. You can find some of them in the hall uh, if you want. Um, so what is the most important and what is, in your opinion, really missing now? What do we need in terms of data on which topic uh, and so on? So I'll start maybe with you, uh, Michel. Um, I'll start with what is missing because I, I can't come up with anything actually. Um, so um, I, I want to actually uh, continue on um, uh, Mr. Marchandis' point. I think uh, one of the things that is missing is, uh, I'll put in a bit harsh language, is the study of exploitation. Mm -hmm. um, because, um, you know, just to give an anecdote, uh, in the book by Ross Dawson about crowdsourcing, there is uh, some cases, and there is a woman that says, oh, I needed a logo, and I put an award for $120, and 99 people participate in the content, in the contest, and I have a fantastic logo. Isn't that nice? Well, I'm not sure that it's nice that 99 people out of 100 worked on the same project without getting any money. So uh, th this is really a key issue uh, of the dark side uh, of distributed labor, uh, which is you know um, who 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 captures the value and who takes the risk. And I think this is something important. The second thing is, even when it's working well, uh, you know things that we like, like Wikipedia or Wikispeed uh, or open source ecology. I'll just give three examples. Uh, Wikipedia, for example, for me has a very dysfunctional governance because the people who know the rules but not the subject are in power. So it's not like open source software where the best technical people have most power. In Wikipedia, you have something very strange where the people who know don't know the subject rule the people who know about the subject. So for me, that's a, a question mark. Now, for example, Wikispeed, which I'm very enthusiastic about, uh, an open source car, well, I, they say they're open hardware, but if you have to, if when you sign their papers, it's a non-disclosure agreement. So what does that mean? I don't know, but I'd like to know, and I'd like researchers to be on top of those questions. Uh, open Source Ecology, another project I'm very excited about. You know, 50 machines in open hardware. Yes, but they just uh, had their third mass exodus out of the project. So people keep leaving uh, en masse that project. Why? And so all these things are you know, you, you have to scratch and, and dig, and I do it uh, out of pleasure, uh, but I'd like more people <laughs> uh, to do this, and especially students, and uh, to be, um, to be okay, okay, now I found my, uh, my example. So is this is not finished yet, but I'm very enthusiastic about this. Uh, for the first time, uh, the HEC in Montreal, uh, which is a business school, has mobilized students from 30 different countries to study a the Open Value Accounting System of Sensorica, which is an absolutely innovative project where there's no labor, no capital, no ownership. Uh, people contribute to the open hardware sensors, uh, log their time, get peer evaluated, get karma, and then there's a kind of funnel system that when there is income later on goes back. So they, there is fairness in the system. Now to mobilize 30 students from 30, you know, from a highly prestigious business school to do not study a big company, but study a project like that, I think this is a good start. So I don't think the res results are in because it was on May 1st, but that's my example of where things need to go. Uh, Sensorica, Open Value Accounting, and it's the HEC in Montreal who started doing this on May 1st. So it, it barely started, but uh, interesting project. Who wants to follow up, um, Francesca? Um, yeah, maybe um, to add on that, I think really what's really missing is that we're talking about a very fragmented field. I think even the words we're using, I think we even miss a shared language and a shared vocabulary. 
And I like to quote this, like the map is not the territory sentence when I talk about how to do research on this field. And I think my, the main problem I see there is even going beyond the discipline question. Because yes, it's true, you need a kind of multidisciplinarity, multidisciplinary approach, and we know how hard it is. I mean, uh, all of us which are in academia know how hard it's really doing yeah, mixing research. economics, social science, complex systems, and so on. Yeah, completely, but, but also even philosophy and even I, I, and even you know like human sciences and all of that with together with design and engineering and technology and so on. And but I think beyond the discipline, what's really missing is a kind of coherent framework to understand the phenomenon and even a new type of framework, which is a more collaborative framework, I would say, in which the problem is really okay. Technology cannot tell us all. And if you only look at technology, you miss the whole context. So you need to integrate the, the understanding of the technology in a more kind of socioeconomic, jurisprudential, and, and business context. And you need to see it as a coherent whole, and then you need to have also a critical approach with what's going on, and integrate you know, some kind of critical framework. And this doesn't apply only to research. I think, for example, this applies to policy making a lot. I mean, if you want to regulate something in this space, uh, for example, you do a kind of directive which goes in a, you know, from the Commission to the Parliament, it takes ages to get approved. For example, the Data Protection Directive, which is very, I mean, for here, for the open data kind of movement, it's very important. But then once the legislator has a piece of legislation on paper, the whole technology field has already changed and then you have to do it again. So how do we embed these? together with the technology, you know, in a framework that help us to regulate, legislate, and at the same time act. And this is a very, uh, I think, is a very important question. And, um, and the other thing, and yes, and the other thing I wanted to say is the challenge with the field. I mean, Michael talks a lot about let's investigate the value side. And I would say, I mean, there I do really see a kind of very controversial, very conflicting environment. So for example, with Fabrizio, we run a study on the future. Uh, we, we are updating some scenarios done by the Oxford Internet Institute on the, the future of the internet and how it looks like. And to be honest, you know, this kind of vision that we are picturing here, it's a possible almost utopic kind of grassroots citizen-led vision, which today though, it's coexisting with a total recentralization and the verticalization of the internet infrastructure in ways that we never saw before. So today, I mean, uh, while people love to share and love to build kind of decentralized, do-it-yourself systems that might scale, today these companies need to plug in very vertically integrated ecosystems with very large corporations, I mean, mainly in the US, because let's talk about it. I mean, Europe and the US have a, a different socioeconomic structure and lots of things things happen in the US don't work in Europe. And now you have very large companies which start controlling the whole vertically integrated ecosystem, you know, from the cloud to the infrastructure to the device. And it's very hard for a small company to be sustainable without plugging in, for example, Facebook to get your data. And I think this is a massive problem because, for example, Zynga was a very profitable company until on a certain point, Facebook changed a business model and that Zynga, Zynga, like the value of Zynga went down. So I think you can't really talk about sustainability. And on top of that, I think for the young innovators, most of the time they tell you, well, look, we have no venture capital funding here, so travel and go to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, sure. But uh, I mean, we can also go to China. Uh, but I think, you know, with the, the, the different socioeconomic structures, for example, in, in Europe, where you have 96% uh, of micro enterprise, which today are closing every day, you know what I'm saying? Like, actually, the, the economic um, situation doesn't look that bright. So we know that there is a very conflicting scenarios there. And if we want this vision that we're building together with this community to actually go to a stage where it can make an impact, we do have to do integrated research and transform the frameworks, I think. Thank you, Francesca. Fabrizio? Well, uh, as for examples, uh, as you say, the this is uh, uh, uncharted territory, is uh, something where we are going a bit like, uh, uh, I feel a bit like Darwin at the Galapagos. Uh, I'm observing uh, strange beasts uh, walking. Uh, close to I'm observing strange beasts walking uh, uh, in, in the sea or on the earth, uh, and I'm trying to understand uh, 
uh, where they come from and where they could go and uh, what is uh, the, the, the rationale or the theory behind. So uh, if yeah, I look at examples, and now I don't want to endorse in particular any activity, but uh, uh, I see nice examples trying to empower citizens uh, to uh, use citizens as a sources of information and also to give back this information to citizens uh, as open data. For instance, uh, uh, an example which I like a lot is a safe cast. You know, they are collecting uh, radiation measures from citizens uh, and then uh, uh, making a, a, an online map about radiation levels, uh, uh, not corresponding necessarily to official maps and uh, giving a really providing information that will not be available otherwise. And you can imagine many other uh, ways of uh, collecting uh, very important data about uh, the environment, uh, but not only about the environment, about also uh, uh, democracy, about uh, participation, about inclusion, uh, about any aspect of social life uh, uh, collected uh, in an open manner and then made available to citizens in order to drive also uh, not only individual behaviors, uh, but also collective decisions and political decisions. So uh, you can see really the seeds for transforming society through these instruments. Now, what we need to do, uh, that is more difficult to say because uh, uh, in general what I think is that uh, we need to fund more pilots, more experiments in this field, uh, especially exploring the convergence between uh, these, uh, uh, I would say there are three trends which are going on uh, in the internet nowadays, uh, which, are, uh, uh, which have a very huge potential for this. On one side you have the, the wiki phenomenon, so the Wikipedia, the Wikileaks, uh, this uh, collective uh, production of knowledge. On the other side, you have the social networks, so the possibility to connect and to share information uh, at unprecedented scales, uh, so between millions, between billions of people, and I'm not talking about Facebook, which is a system to, uh, to maintain closed communities of people, but uh, I'm talking about the potential of social networks to be really open and distributed. And then uh, you have uh, also the other emerging area of sensor networks, what we call in our jargon Internet of Things, uh, which means uh, uh, not only uh, monitoring the environment, uh, but actually being in a, a more direct contact with the environment, with society, to get information not mediated by the traditional mediators, uh, be they uh, journalists or politicians or uh, whatever other source of uh, uh, helping to get this information from the environment, but uh, having systems which can put people in contact with what is going on and then uh, getting a, a, a more uh, direct uh, and uh, uh, complete awareness about what the problems are and what the possible solutions can be. So yeah. what we see as uh, action, and that is actually reflected and will be reflected in the next calls uh, of this collective awareness program, which will have a budget around uh, 30 million euro, we hope, uh, uh, and will be published at the end of this year, uh, is uh, on one side uh, to launch more pilots for experiments in this direction, which uh, we hope uh, secretly, I hope, uh, uh, have the potential to become uh, perhaps the best, uh, the, the next uh, big thing on the internet. I don't say the next Google or the next Facebook or the next Wikipedia, but uh, still uh, uh, something that uh, could come from Europe also and reflect the collaborative aspects of Europe. And on the other side, uh, to understand uh, some uh, underlying uh, research topics or uh, horizontal issues such as uh, reputation, uh, such as uh, new economic models, uh, uh, which are more theoretical aspects, uh, which we uh, think uh, have to be understood in an empirical manner, such as in any uh, good science, uh, from the observation of nature, from the observation of what works and what doesn't, uh, in order to drive uh, better projects for the future. Thank you. Um, Jacques-François, I'm going to try to ask you to be as brief as possible so we can ag get save some time for a question of the audience. Yes, so if you ask me the question, I, I will tell you why uh, I, I think there, there is something to do yet Co with disciplines. Uh, but uh, I, um, uh, the if I find the things that are very inspiring, first is the researchers on, uh, on, on uh, the commons uh, that exist in, in various fields, for instance, uh, on in cultural the studies, the as to in, in cultural studies as well as uh, the, the free software economy. My, my colleagues at uh, Marsouin in uh, Brittany uh, did uh, a lot of good work about it. Uh, and the, the other field that is 
particularly interesting is the, uh, the field of participation in democracy. That is really interesting to understand uh, uh, how uh, participation uh, occurs in, in economy. Thank you, Jacques Francois. So uh, we would have the time to take, I think, two questions from the audience. So, yes. So the question is about um, how about like short-term pragmatic uh, research and data compared to uh, long-term research? Please be brief in your answer. Yeah, well, uh, actually, th that is exactly the subject of the study that uh, Francesca uh, and Nesta uh, are running, uh, have are just starting to run. Uh, so we will publish the results of this study uh, periodically in the next uh, months. Uh, uh, the study is supposed to last 18 months. But already in a couple of months, you should have some preliminary results about this mapping of activities and trying to assess the real value of these initiatives. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. more in general about SMEs, just to say that uh, uh, in this uh, call, uh, uh, or collective awareness, which was really an experiment, uh, we saw a very uh, an increased participation of, of SMEs compared to the average of uh, the ICT program. We saw 18% of participants are SMEs. And then also we saw a very high participation from NGOs and local communities. Uh, so from uh, some of these uh, strange beasts which normally do not apply to the European programs. So we are very positive that for the future there will be more participation and I really uh, mm, mm, want to motivate you to, to go to our website. Uh, you find it just Google Collective Awareness uh, and try to contribute or to give feedback to us about what you would like to see in this program and what you think are the uh, main barriers for the participation uh, uh, at that level. Okay, another question? Yeah. Okay. Can you stand up, please? My question is about trust and uh, the question of trust in uh, your research. And uh, we are hearing some people saying that uh, trust could be uh, the next mean uh, to value the exchanges and uh, maybe the next money. So what do you think about that? Excellent question. Who wants to answer? Um, well, I mean, maybe also Michael, but from my point of view, I think, yes, certainly. And we're seeing that... Um, in the way that you know the internet mediates lots of more personal you know types of transaction and exchanges where knowing each other and also being even in uh, proximity in lo location proximity is really important i think what's behind that is that kind of um, social data i would say and data in general big data but social and personal data is becoming a kind of a currency in the internet economy and I think as a designer of the future systems of the Internet of Things or the collaborative economy, I think we have even a duty there to make sure that social and personal data, yes, is valuable for your business, but at the same time, you know, we are really um, aware that privacy and, and, and collective awareness on this topic is really an issue. So I think what, I've seen, what I'm seeing is that a big marketplace, a big identity market, marketplace is happening so there is a lot of transaction going on with data in the background and when users sign their service legal agreement they have they have no idea of what's happening with the data so I think that innovation in that front will be really required on trust on the service level agreement um, you know issues and creating new systems for identity in which users and communities control their data 
And I think this is, this is gonna become a, a, a huge innovation. And if, if you on top of that, you link trust with new currencies, <laughs> for example, alternative currencies, such as Bitcoin or other forms of currency, virtual currency, trust and identity, I think it's gonna be really interesting to design a system in which we put communities and users and citizens in control of data. Uh, it's a great field of experimentation, I think. Yeah, I think we published a, a book about uh, a trust last year, uh, following one year of uh, collective work about it. And the, the issue would be that uh, uh, th there is a, uh, an important uh, thing with the grassroots trust, uh, horizontal trust, uh, compared to, to uh, the, the vertical ways uh, that uh, would exist before. Okay, we're going into end now. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks a lot for all your insights. And uh, <laughs> very nice. Very good.